I'm Aisha. You can now watch UCF TV 24 hours a day on Bright House Digital Channel 1. This program made possible in part by grants from the UCF College of Health and Public Affairs, which promotes excellence in undergraduate and graduate education, research, and community service in health-related professions and public affairs. And the UCF College of Medicine, where our goal is to become America's leading partnership medical school and a national leader in medical education and research. And the UCF College of Nursing, which offers high-quality, innovative academic programs that reflect the health care needs of a changing population and meet the needs of today's students. Hello everyone, welcome to For Your Health. I'm Ed Hyland. And I'm Charna davis Weesey. On today's show, as the nursing profession works to attract nurses to academia, one UCF professor stands out as a living example of why becoming an educator is a good choice. Also today, doctors have a new way to determine whether LASIK is a risk for you. I'm Alicia Callanan Mandigo. Speech pathology students are getting to work in a unique environment. I'll have that story. But first, let's check on the very latest health news from UCF. LASIK eye surgery has been a breakthrough for millions of patients, but not everyone comes out of it okay. Some people have an eye disease that gets worse with LASIK, but doctors now have a way to screen for that. It's easy. Place your chin on your chin rest. Painless. Let me see some bright lights here. Fast. Blink, blink, blink. In the blink of an eye, Kristen Coons discovers LASIK surgery is no longer an option. That's when he said, you know what, I don't think you can have LASIK. Kristen's eyes look normal, but pictures from this orb scan machine yeah, a show a thin, irregular so cornea. With LASIK, which weakens the cornea, Kristen could have developed keratoconus. It causes bulging of the eye and distorted vision. There is some chance uh, with LASIK that that might progress faster or progress when it might not have progressed had we not done surgery. Good, okay, now open, and you're going to feel a puff of air in just a second here. With a puff of air, the ocular response analyzer measures corneal strength. Doctors can now use it with the orb scan to red flag patients wanting LASIK. Looks really good, and then we're going to look over here. Until now, doctors relied on a clinical exam, which rarely caught the disease in its early stage. You would have just done LASIK, and then that would have been it. And if I would have had a problem, I wouldn't have found out, obviously, until afterward. <laughs> Rather than LASIK, Kristen chose PRK surgery where the outer cornea layer is removed instead of folded back and recovery time is longer. She missed four days of work, but is convinced she made an eye-saving decision. This is Casey Taylor reporting. An estimated four and a half million people have LASIK surgery each year. The majority of those patients have great results. 
top faculty honors recently went to a professor from the College of Nursing. Dr. Mary Lou Soul received the Pegasus Professor Award. That award comes at a time when nursing schools across the country are working to attract students to a career in academia. Joining us today is Dr. Soul, who's in a perfect position to discuss the merits of teaching nursing and also the absolute need for it, just as we are getting into a crunch time where there's a real concern about the amount of nurses we'll have in the next 10, 20 years, you need people to teach it. Correct, correct. Um, being a faculty member is very important to increasing the number of people we have out that we can educate as nurses. And being a faculty member is a very, very rewarding career. And we have got to have the nurses that are in the faculty positions that can then be out there because we need faculty members who can be teaching students in the clinical setting how to be the best nurses that they can be. We have faculty members who are teaching in the classroom, faculty members who are doing research that we can work with our higher level students. But we have to have people that have a master's degree or higher who can teach and we want to encourage our people that they want to become faculty members within schools of nursing and colleges of nursing. At the same time, there, there's kind of a, um, a crunch, if you will. It's very difficult for students who might be interested in getting into nursing and academia from that standpoint uh, because the schools are running out of space, running out of available teachers to teach them. That, that is correct. We have many, many people now that are actually being turned away from nursing programs because they're at capacity or because there's not enough faculty that can teach them. So that's why this today is very important to let people know that faculty members uh, is an, another career that they can choose. The main issue with the, sh with the um, absence of clinical space and faculty members oftentimes comes with those we're, that we're trying to prepare as the beginning nurses or the basic nurses that are just newly licensed registered nurses. We have plenty of space in our programs for those who are interested in becoming faculty members. We have nurse educator tracks and other clinical tracks that at that graduate level that are open and we have space in those programs without any problems to help prepare those people to become teachers. For a nurse that's interested in this. What is there a, 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 a amount of experience, amount of years actually being a nurse in the nursing profession that's really optimal before you actually decide to go back and get your master's degree or your PhD? Charna, that is a great question because there will be people that will give you different answers for that. Some people will say you need, you know, two, three, five years experience. We're trying to look at the individual people and try to look at nursing as a profession similar to others that as soon as you're done with school, let's continue on with your master's degree and your doctorate degree. So we have people that are faculty members that are starting their career as faculty young versus later in life, which has still been the norm throughout the nursing profession. So the real challenge now for colleges is to get people that are young, eager, that want to um, succeed in their profession is to continue right on through their baccalaureate, masters, and doctoral degrees. Now, yes, you need that experience in there, but everyone is different. And I, I guess I'm a perfect example. I started teaching very young in my career because someone asked me to do that and said, we'd like you to do this. And it made my career, it's what made my career is that I've been teaching ever since as long, as well as maintaining you know, clinical expertise. And I don't know that I would have done that had not somebody said to you, to me, please, why don't you consider doing this? You may, maybe didn't even know that that was available to you without the years behind you. That's, that is correct because, again, people say, oh, you need this amount of expertise. But you do have to be competent in what you do. So we, you have to ensure that you're competent before you can go on to become a teacher. But it's uh, a very rewarding career, and it's something that we want to encourage our people to do very early now. We're going to talk more about teaching and nursing and research and the many other facets you're involved in. But first, we have to take a short break, and here's a look at the College of Nursing.
We're back. We're talking with Dr. Mary Lou Soule from the UCF College of Nursing. It feels good to say that, I bet to you, because you were School of Nursing until very recently. And to those of us who are outside of the confines of the medical community, that may not be, we may not understand the implications of how big that was, that it, the co it's now a College of Nursing. Um, that is correct. Last year, we, uh, as of July 1, became the College of Nursing. Prior to that, we were a School of Nursing within the College of Health and Public Affairs, uh, which was a good place for us within the college. But now, being an independent college gives us the opportunity to um, be more autonomous in what we do, to establish different partnerships, for example, with the College of Medicine, with other groups. And if you look at the top tier schools within the United States, they all have an independent college or school of nursing, but it has its own independent structure which deletes some of the layers you have to go through to get um, changes in the program, curriculum issues, um, hiring, some of those things. So it's really been um, good for us to be that college. And it puts us on equal par with other colleges within the health professions. I think, I think it's interesting. It certainly is to me when, when I look at the college and I see how broad ranging the subjects are, the, the areas that nurses can get into. And, and I think for so long, a lot of late people outside the, the university setting will say, well, nursing, it's, it's kind of going in and helping doctors. And they really don't realize just how much you can do as a nurse. No, in fact, um, nursing, if you think about it, whether it's in the community or in the inpatient setting, nurses care for patients their entire shift, whereas the physician will come in and make rounds and leave. It's the nurses who then see that the rest of the care gets done during that time. And nurses is, are essential in things like preventing errors. You hear all the information out there now about patient safety issues. What's the nurses that are there that can look at what are the best way to prevent falls, prevent pressure ulcers, to um, prevent infection. So it's together collaboratively with the physician, but it's the nurse, a lot of times it's the nursing care that can help in ensuring that safe patient care and preventing errors. So, and in the community, it's nurses then that can help the patients to look at what's the best way to ensure that they take their medicines or what's the best way they can do to, to do what they're supposed to do to have healthy behaviors. So nursing is very diverse, so we can practice in the community setting, we can practice in the acute care setting. So it's wide open of what we have opportunities for. And these days, uh, uh, I go to my doctor and uh, his backup, if you will, uh, the person standing right beside him is often a nurse practitioner. Well, the, in addition to the nursing shortage, there's been a physician shortage as well. So in order to care for uh, patients in that primary care setting and sometimes in the acute care setting, uh, nurse practitioners are widely used uh, to help see more patients and uh, provide that primary care uh, for common illnesses and diseases. You're also part of the, let me get this right, Biomedical Research Council. That's correct. Tell us about that. Um, the Biomedical Research Council, or the Biomedical Research Advisory Committee, uh, was formed by the state of Florida. Uh, it's a group of scientists and appointees from the community to help make decisions about funded research within the state. There's two key research uh, programs that were funded by tobacco money, and it's the uh, James and Esther King by, um, tobacco grant, and there's a Bankhead Coley grant. One of them is to help address health issues related to tobacco use. The other is related to preventing cancer. And there are grants given to um, nurses uh, and other scientists, physicians, um, and biomolecular people to um, help solve those problems. So the Biomedical Research uh, Advisory Council helps to look at what's the mechanisms for giving those grants, how are grants chosen, and help to look at who gets funded. So it's a, uh, representatives from throughout the state, and we are all appointed by either the governor or by uh, Speaker of the House or um, the Senate. Let's talk about research in just a moment, but we're going to take another short break. We'll be back in just a moment.
And we're back once again talking about nursing with Dr. Mary Lou Soule. Thank you once again for joining us. And I wanted, before we uh, run out of time, get a chance to talk a little bit about your research, uh, another area of nursing that I don't think is really talked about enough. You've got two major projects going on. Why don't you give us an idea of uh, uh, what's going on with the, the breathing uh, uh, project that you've been so involved in and got the grant for? Okay, well, as a, uh, a nurse scientist and a faculty member, I'm actively involved in research. I have two funded studies right now with the uh, National Institute of Health. And the one I'm most excited about is looking at airway management strategies to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia in critically ill patients. And it's a collaborative study uh, with physicians, nurses, and respiratory therapy and engineering uh, to look at how we can improve uh, patients from ha aspirating their secretions from their mouth into their lungs. So we're actually right now just testing a, a very simple intervention of keeping um, the endotracheal tube, the, which is the breathing tube, uh, exactly as it should be so that we can prevent those secretions from going down. So it's a very labor-intensive study because it's in the critically um, ill patient and we are with the patients for 12 hours at a time. But it's really an opportunity to collaborate with my peers uh, within the um, college and within the community to really conduct a, a good clinical study that nursing can lead to something, again, that nurses can help make a difference in. And then the other study I've been involved is, and it's a collaborative study, I'm not the primary investigator with, but I'm the investigator with the uh, College Health Services at UCF to look at how we can promote um, healthy behaviors in college students with, that includes uh, reducing high-risk drinking. And that study is just at its final stages now, and I've been very active uh, collaborating with them over the past three years on that study um, to help make that go well. That seems like it's almost more insurmountable than the airway study to reduce drinking behavior in college students. How is that going? What, what, what are you finding initially? Um, that particular study was looking at a brief intervention that was delivered by the uh, physicians and nurse practitioners and physician assistants within the health center um, to help look at could they change their behaviors to um, promote healthy behaviors. And uh, thus far, it was very successful in the people that, in, that went through that brief intervention at the three and six month period to help them um, think about their behaviors of, of high risk drinking, think about what are the outcomes, and help them change some of their behaviors um, in that respect. So we had very good results from that and uh, are very excited about looking at what we can do in the next phase of that. And it's so different from my critical care research, but if we can keep people having healthy behaviors to keep them out of the ICU, I've uh, taken that, that that's still very important research to be done. I was going to ask, uh, does, does the next phase involve perhaps expanding it? Because I know anyone that hears about something like this would like to say, hey, bring it to my university or college or my kids. Well, that uh, Dr. Jim Schaus is the primary investigator on that, and that is his goal is to get the word out, and it's with the college health meetings and at other meetings, and we've taken the, um, the data to the, uh, nursing meetings, physician meetings, um, psychology meetings, to all of them of what works and to show how this did work and how it was done. And we'd like to actually look at a next phase of perhaps looking at some type of a web-based together with personal feedback to help um, reach more people with that particular study. And you've done that with web-based triage in college students already. So you already have kind of like a, an, an idea of how to start that and how that would work. That's, that's exactly right. Uh, we did another study collaboratively with the College Health Center and looking at what kind of people uh, within the health services use uh, the web-based uh, decision-making. So we do have that experience of using the web to um, garner students to, get, to uh, get access to the web. And of course, our college students today are more, much more web savvy than we will ever be. And it's very normal for them to utilize the web for uh, information. Dr. Mary Lou Soule, thank you so much for coming by and joining us once again on For Your Health. Uh, always, always enlightening. Thank you. Well, it's time now to check in with UCF's College of Medicine for the very latest. We know that having a medical school will bring new benefits to our community, but a few of the services that you would normally associate with a medical school are already in place at UCF. Alicia Callanan-Mandigo shows us one. 
Okay, so This patient may not know it, but she's receiving a specialized kind of health care that would normally be associated with a teaching hospital. This is the UCF Voice Clinic, a clinic in which speech pathologist Dr. Barry Hoffman Ruddy and ear, nose, and throat specialist Dr. Jeffrey Lehman work in concert. That's what we would refer to as the multidisciplinary approach to voice disorders. Um, and particularly when we're dealing with uh, professional voice users or more difficult vocal conditions, um, there's a lot of power to a multidisciplinary approach. Um, people who come in um, with simpler vocal problems oftentimes can be dealt with with one specialty or the other, either seeing the physician or seeing a speech pathologist alone. There are not a lot of voice clinics like this where a speech pathologist works so closely with a doctor. In fact, they're usually associated with medical schools, which puts UCF a little bit ahead of the curve. Uh, Dr. Lehman and I created uh, the clinic here at uh, uh, the university. This is, uh, kind of acts as a sister uh, office to what we have working in private practice. It's a unique um, setting for our university. Uh, uh, especially uh, in the past since we didn't have a medical school affiliation. Usually you'll see centers like this um, housed in a med school. Voice problems can be caused by a variety of medical conditions and sometimes they're caused by bad habits. The clinic can offer both medicinal and therapy-based solutions at the same time, which is better for the patient. Breathe. <laughs> The clinic also gives these speech pathology students a chance for hands-on experience with patients and the unique experience of working directly with the medical side of voice disorders. Well, I'm definitely fortunate to have this type of relationship and uh, this level of care that we can give to patients. Um, we tend to come together as a united front for the patient to deal with both the medical um, and behavioral issues of a particular disorder, voice disorder. And um, without that uh, level of management, we tend to not be able to help a person maybe get back to what we say normal voice as, as fast. So for patients like this, the UCF Voice Clinic provides the most powerful approach available, that of a doctor and a speech pathologist working side by side. It's good. I'm Alicia Callanan Mandigo for your health. The Voice Disorders Clinic also does research, so patients and students there are definitely on the cutting edge. And that's going to do it for us today. I'm Charna davis Weesey, And I'm Ed Hyland. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time on For Your Health.